If you know me, you know that Duskwood is one of my favorite zones in the entire game, and it's really not that good visually or environmentally. It's just got amazing story. Start to finish, everything in the zone is interesting in my eyes, and a couple of the storylines are so far reaching that they really extend way out of the zone into major lore that gets expounded upon for years to come in World of Warcraft. Now, we already did an episode of this for the Cataclysm version of Duskwood, and frankly, a lot of the stuff is still intact, but there is a lot of small minutia that gets present in the classic, the original versions of the storyline. It just really makes it feel a lot different. And of course, the storylines take place in other zones and some of the surrounding areas really contribute to the overall feel of the storylines too. So today we're going to take a look at three of my favorite storylines, not just in Duskwood, but in the entire game. Let's go. I used to work one of the farms to the southeast, until Dark Riders from Deadwind Pass descended upon my farm and slaughtered my family when I was away. When I returned, I saw a shadowy figure skulking near my barn, burying something. He fled before I could catch him, and I couldn't linger for I was hot on the heels of the Dark Riders, so I never discovered what was hidden. But if you can find what that shadowy figure buried, I would be grateful. The hiding spot is behind the old stump near my barn. The mound of dirt is here, hastily piled up as if someone had need of hiding something, without much time to do it. Digging through the mound, you find a small, dirt-stained book. The book has no title, but it has information Sven would like to know. The terror of these past few weeks is almost more than I can bear, yet I feel that by writing down that which I have seen, I will somehow be comforted. So I do it, and it is the only comfort I have these bleak days. It began with the finding of that cursed scythe in Roland's doom. Before the scythe, the terrors of this place seemed as tame as Northshire Valley. But ever since I found the haft of the scythe jutting from that pile of rubble in the mine and, curse me, pulled it free, Brolin Doom became a place of vile death. After the scythe was freed, they came at us from everywhere, clawing from the hidden holes at our feet and dropping upon us from silent perches above. Half our men fell in those first panic minutes. The rest included myself tried to flee. As I ran, I saw so many of my brothers taken by tooth and claw, hearing so many screams cut short or gurgle to silence. I can only guess why I survived that night. I have always been cautious, always quick to flinch from jabs and leap free of pitfalls. My nickname comes from this trait, so perhaps it was just that knack or caution that saved me. Or maybe it was the scythe I pulled from that rubble. It cannot be the scythe itself, for I lost it during my frantic flight. But if it was, was I who brought the worgen to Duskwood? Then perhaps the worgen afforded me a rare courtesy. After surviving the flight from Roland's doom, I hid within a barn owned by a man named Sven. I spent a few days in the barn, and such horror lingered with me that I never once made myself known to Sven or his family. But from what I saw from my hiding place, I knew these farmers were quite decent folk. Had I stepped from my concealment, I think they would have taken me in, but trust is hard for me. Harder still after that shock in the mine. So I remain hidden. The rest of the book is blank. You found what? Please, let me see it. Sven reads the book pages, then slams it shut. That shadowy figure I saw was a witness to my family's death. There are questions I'd like to ask that man. If only I knew who he was. I must know who that skulker in the shadows I saw the night my family was killed. Please, Gidwin, you have shown your resourcefulness. Please find that shadowy figure. I must learn what secrets he holds. I do not have clues that you do not already know, but here, take the book you found at my farm. Perhaps some of the townsfolk can link this book to its owner. Light bless you. King's honor, friend. If you have something that belongs to the shadowy figure from who you seek, then let me see it. I may be able to divine something of its owner. Hmm. Someone handled this book recently. Someone who is driven by revenge. But the impressions left on it, at least the impressions from the original owner, are faint. I can tell, however, that the original owner of this book is not a native of Darkshire. Here's your book back, Gidwin, and I bid you fortune with your search. If you ask others in town, perhaps they can offer you more clues. And here is one more for you. Although the author of this book is a stranger to Darkshire, the book itself was purchased here. 
Be careful. How are you? Sometimes I'll sell blank books to scholars and mages, or to anyone who wants to keep a journal. I remember well everyone to whom I sold a book within the last few months. Ah, uh, yes. I sold this book a month ago to a shady person. He didn't tell me his name, but he was nervous. Jittery chap. Always looking over his shoulders. I hope that helps you. Here is your book, and good luck with your inquiries. You might want to expand your search to the inn. If the person whom you seek spent time in town, there's chances that someone saw him there. Greetings. Scarlet Raven doesn't see the business it used to, but we still do get travelers passing through. If you can describe the person you're looking for, maybe I'll remember him. Oh, I remember this book. Its owner rented a room a few days ago and spent his nights at the bar writing. He left town in a hurry, muttering about being hunted by... something. Last I saw him, he was heading west out of town, looking for a new spot to hide. The first place he'd find to the west is Raven Hill. <laughs> Good luck, Gidwin. I hope you find the chap, and I hope you find him alive. If he's left the safety of Darkshire, then he could be prey to the beasts of the wilds. Find the shadowy figure. Here are your clues. He is not native to Darkshire. He is a nervous, jittery person. He left Darkshire and headed west. See you around. Hello. You need something? Who are you? Leave me be. Chitter sighs. Yes, I am the author of that book. You finally found me, eh? Well, if you read that journal, then you only know half of it. The book you found was only half finished. I had to leave it at Sven's farm when I fled there. Here, take my completed journal to Sven. It describes more fully what happened at his farm. Although the journal has been my only company these past weeks, if giving it up keeps me from having to face Sven in his wrath, then I will do it willingly. See you later. The terror of these past few weeks is almost more than I can bear. Why is it that by writing words into this book, I can somehow keep the madness at bay? Perhaps it is as if I'm confessing my sins to a silent companion, or freeing my mind of these tortured thoughts and confining them to paper. I began a journal before this one, but it remains in a place to which I cannot return, so I will start afresh. But this time, I will start from the true beginning. It began with the finding of that cursed scythe in the mine they call Roland's Doom. Yes, that was the start of it. Before that, the Defias Brotherhood was happy with their progress in Duskwood. Before the scythe, the terrors of this place seemed as tame as Northshire Valley. But ever since I found the haft of the scythe jutting from that pile of rubble in the mine and, curse me, hold it free, Roland's Doom became a place of vile death. If I had known what would happen, I would have cut off my own hand to keep from grasping that rude carved wood. So many regrets. I always thought that was a privilege of the old. I now know that it is not the old, it is the hopeless, who don the mantle of regret, unable and unwilling to shrug it from shoulders stooped with misery. But enough waxing like a pipe-mad poet. I must continue with the chronicle. After the scythe was freed, a change rippled through the mine. Light from our flickering torches warped, and the strength of our voices seemed beyond our control. Sometimes a man whispered roar through the tunnels, forcing hands on ears, and sometimes our shouts barely traveled a few steps before diminishing into a hint of the wind. Unnerving, yes, but we did not have long to wonder at this strangeness. It was but a harbinger of what truly drove us from the mine, the worgen. They came at us from everywhere, clawing from hidden holes at our feet and dropping upon us from silent perches above. Half our men fell in the first panic minutes. The rest, including myself, tried to flee. As I ran, I saw so many of my brothers taken by tooth and claw, heard so many screams cut short or gurgled to silence. For all I know, I am the only human to escape that place. I can only guess why I survived that night. I have always been cautious always quick to flinch from jabs and leap free of pitfalls. My nickname, Jitters, comes from this trait. So perhaps it was just that knack for caution that saved me. Or maybe it was the scythe I pulled from the rubble. It cannot be the scythe itself, for I lost it during my frantic flight. But if it was I who brought the worgen to Duskwood, then perhaps the worgen afforded me a rare courtesy. Or perhaps I am doomed to witness the change I wrought on Duskwood. 
Perhaps it is my fate to watch as the worgen tear into this land, staining it ever darker with their foulness. If that truly is my fate, then it is twofold. The worgen are not the only power to clutch at Duskwood. The fiends from Deadwind Pass have also staked claim. That is the next chapter of my tale, and I pray it is the last. After surviving the flight from Roland's doom, I hid within a barn owned by a man named Sven. I spent a few days in the barn, and such horror lingered with me that I never once made myself known to Sven or his family. But from what I saw from my hiding place, I knew these farmers were quite decent folk. Had I stepped from my concealment, I think they would have taken me in. But trust is hard for me, harder still after that shock in the mine. So I remained hidden, and it saved my life. A few days after I arrived at the barn, Sven left his farm for Darkshire. He kissed his wife and smiled to his children and promised to return soon with toys and sweets. That poor man. That was the last time he saw his family unmutilated. At least they parted happily. And at least his wife was the first to die and was freed from seeing the slaughter of her children. But these small graces do nothing for me. I saw what happened and it will ever haunt my dreams. My hand trembles as I recall the details of that night. When Sven was away, and his family was doomed to face the Black Riders alone, again, regret claws at me, for I was there, and I couldn't have risen against those fiends from Deadwind Pass. But it is a false regret. It is the same that plagues any survivor of a tragedy. I know that, had I left my place of hiding, I too would have been killed. My body ripped and torn, and its pieces spread so widely that I would not be recognized. But even though I know I could have done nothing to stop the heinous murder, one true regret does remain. I brought the Black Riders to Sven's farm. My discovery of the scythe not only unleashed the worgen upon Duskwood, it drew the Riders from Deadwind Pass. I know this because just before they began their slaughter, they asked one question to Sven's wife as she held her children close, giving them what comfort she could, though she was certain death was near. The scythe of a loon, one of the Riders shrieked, in a voice both harsh and shrill, like the grinding of an axe on stone. And the last word, a loon, it croaked, as if choking on the sound. Dread gripped me when I heard that voice, both from the horrid sound of it, and because I knew the scythe of which the rider spoke. It must be the same cursed thing I drew from the rocks of Roland's doom days before. It was what the black rider sought, and it was what would kill Sven's family. I never learned the name of Sven's wife, as she was only ever called Dearest, and My Love, and Mommy, by her husband and children, but I wish I knew it. I am the only living memory of her deed that day, and although she was just a farmer's wife, never have I seen a man or woman act with such bravery. Of course, she did not know of the scythe, but when she learned the writer sought it, in an instant a plan formed in her head, and it was bold and clever, if only it had worked. The scythe, she said in a calm voice. Of course I do. Who here wouldn't? She looked at the riders with steady eyes, and I would have sworn she spoke the truth if I had not known better. There was no way she could have known about the scythe. Her gambit paid off. The same rider who uttered the question before bent his head slightly towards her and shrieked, Where? I'll take you, all of you, she said, and I could see a small hope flicker behind her eyes. But the way is far, and my children would slow us. We must leave them. Her trick was simple, but simple tricks have the best hope of success. If it worked, it would leave the riders away from the farm. She would be lost, but her children would be safe, and it would work if only the riders believed her noble lies. Although I have never been a student of light, I prayed fiercely for Sven's wife as she stood against those terrible riders. Please, I prayed. Let them believe. They stood frozen, and she met their gazes with calm. Then one rider looked up, as if hearing a distant call, he drew from his garb a small gem and peered into it. He then gestured with the bauble towards Sven's wife. A light crept from the rider towards the woman, shaping itself into a grim white hand. She stared into the light, unflinching, but I could see uncertainty behind her mask of confidence. When the hand reached her, it spread its fingers over her head, and it squeezed. Sven's wife stood rigid as a board, and her eyes grew wide, and although her lips pulled back, to mouth the scream, no sound escaped. After a few moments of this torture, the hand released her, dropping her to her knees. The rider who held the bauble then sat erect in his saddle, and a loud voice erupted from it. 
This woman lies, it said in a voice that had scared my dreams. She has not seen the scythe. After this, the rider's shoulders stooped slightly, as if a spirit within him had fled. And then, in the old shrieking voice it used earlier, these final words were uttered. The Lord has spoken. Kill them. I cannot describe what happened next. It is clear in my mind, but even my wretched soul cannot put to paper the events of those next few grisly minutes. I can only write that Sven's family was killed, and soon after Sven returned to this grim, deathly scene. Such grief was in him that I was afraid to show myself, and so afraid was I that he would find me. I fled from my hiding spot in the barn. I do not know where Sven is now, but I pray he will someday find peace. I spent the next few weeks moving from place to place, never lingering for fear of the riders. I am now in the abandoned town of Ravens Hill, as always, hiding. I cannot face whatever power they used against Sven's wife, and I know it searches Duskwood, even still, for the scythe. It is lost to me, and I thank the light for this, for had I kept it, I know I would have been found. Even now, I know in my heart that I will be found. I am so tired. Greetings. Did, did you find who the shadowy figure was? Well, this journal explains much to me and sets me on the path against the Dark Riders. I have seen these riders in Duskwood, and I have seen them speak with the wizard Morbent Fell at the Forlorn Row. Morbent Fell is a necromancer and an ally to the Dark Riders. I would pit you against the power of Morbent Fell, but I will not send you against that vile fiend without first knowing your strength. You have already proven your bravery to me, but if you truly wish to face the necromancer, then you must now prove your skill against his minions. Skill in combat, Gidwin, cannot be doubted. Your resolve may yet see us through to the end of Morbin Fell. Go to the city of Stormwind and speak with Bishop Farthing in the Cathedral of Light. Give him Jitter's journal and tell him you mean to face Morbin Fell. Although Stormwind has forsaken Darkshire, Farthing is a kind soul and very wise. He may help you on your quest to save us. Your mission is perilous, but hurry, Gidwin. With each passing hour, the shadows of Dustwood grow even darker. Light bless you. Hey there. Rest, brother. I can tell you have traveled far, and you bear a heavy burden. Can you tell me what casts that dark shadow over you? After reading the journal and hearing your intent, an evil taint has gained a foothold within the already beleaguered Duskwood. I thank the light we have a hero such as you to face it. But you must first prepare yourself for the coming trial. For the necromancer Morbid Fell is immensely powerful, and has cast dark enchantments about himself to protect him from physical assaults. If you are to defeat him, you will need a weapon that is proof against these protections. Years ago, the third fleet of Kul'tiris sunk off the coast of the wetlands, an expanse of marsh north of the dwarven kingdom of Ironforge. Aboard one ship was a load of lightforged iron. This metal is precious to us, for items crafted from it strike with holy truth. If you are to face Morbid Fell, then you will need such a weapon. Go to Menenthal Harbor and speak with my dwarven colleague, Glorin Steelbrow. If that lost metal can be found, he'll know where to look. Have a good one. What can I do for ya? Lifeforge iron is a precious metal, but it sounds like your quest is a dire one. You've come a long way, brother. With luck, you might just find what you seek. And if you do get the iron, I know who can fashion it into a weapon against this necromancer you speak of in Duskwood. The shipwrecks off the shore here are a doomed third fleet of Kul'Tiris burned and sunk by red dragons during the last Great War. The fleet hailed from Lordaeron, but one ship, an elvish destroyer, Flying Osprey, was with it. It was shipping a load of lightforged iron and joined the third fleet for protection. Ironic that it sunk to the same dragons. Enough history. 
Flying Osprey is wrecked to the south of Menethil Harbor, and if you find the Life Forge Iron there, bring it to me. The chest is waterlogged and its sidings broken. Many claw mar, mar both the inside and the outside of the chest, as if the murlocs have searched through it and stolen its treasures. But tucked deep within the chest is a single life forge ignit. Unfortunately, many more will be needed if enough metal to fashion a weapon is to be gained. Having grabbed the single life forge ingot from the waterlogged chest, it is clear that murlocs have stolen the rest. Hunt the murloc raiders near the flying osprey wreckage for the lost life forge iron. To meet you. Did you find the Light Forge iron you need? Now let's get this Light Forge iron hammered into something useful, eh? There's a dwarven weaponsmith in the dwarven district of Stormwind who can uh, craft with Light Forge iron. His name is Grimmon Elmore. I pack the iron you found into a crate. Take it to Grimmon and tell him your tale. I'm sure he'll oblige someone on a quest such as yours and craft for you a weapon. A weapon to give even Morbid Fell worry. No. Uh, that is quite a tale you have, and light forged iron. Not for years have I worked with such a metal. It will be an honor to craft with it again. And you must return to me later with the story of your battle against the necromancer. But we get ahead of ourselves. First, your weapon against morbid fell. Here is the weapon against the fiend of which you spoke. You're all ready, Gidwin. Best of luck to you, and I look forward to your tales of glory. Bring Morbin's bane to Sven in Duskwood. Keep your feet on the ground! You haven't been gone that long, but I see a fire in your eyes I did not see before. Uh, this will be proof against the fiend Morbin Fell. Well done. You are ready. Morbin Fell will fall. Morbin Fell hides in his lair, the house perched atop the hill to the east overlooking the Ravenhill Cemetery. His time in this land is drawing to an end. Use Morbin's bane against him. It will render his protective magics powerless. Slay him. Slay him and save us from this wickedness. Be the instrument of my revenge, and a hero of Duskwood. Use Morbin's Bane on Morbin Fell. Kill Morbin Fell. Then turn Morbin's Bane to Sven at his camp. A lot of mobs. Yep. Have to wait a long time though now. I will heal you while he touch of deaths you. That's what the, the spell is called, touch of death. Greetings. Is Morbin Fell defeated? Morbin Fell has been defeated. The Dark Riders are still at large, but a small piece of that which I had hoped beyond hope has come to pass. You have done the impossible, and your deeds will forever live in the legends of Duskwood. Go, Gidwin, and perhaps one day fate may bring you back to me. Go with honor, friend.
I think it's pretty clear that Blizzard didn't really have a good plan for what was going to happen with the Dark Riders. You could potentially make that same statement with everything related to Karazhan. So it does kind of feel like this storyline is a little cheapened by the fact that they're relating this Morbid Fell character who seems to be at large entirely responsible for all the undeath that is present in Duskwood with the Dark Riders who are clearly not related to that character at all. And if we can overlook that, we still see one of the coolest quest lines in the game. Now, speaking of coolest quest lines in the game, this one is very interesting. It's not the most verbose quest line, but it's very sentimental. And I think all of these quest lines really show just how important it is to slow down and actually read what you're doing if you really want to experience it. Especially in classic, there's not going to be cutscenes and there's not going to be voice acting. So you have to actually take the time to find the info yourself. And you're actually given all the info right in front of you. A lot of people just zoom right by it. The weathered grave marker reads simply, Morgan Lattimore. Upon further examination, you notice that dirt over the grave has been recently disturbed, and that a good amount of the dirt seems to have been displaced. Well met. Morgan Lattimore. Ah, uh, yes, of course. His was a long and sorrowful tale. I knew him well before he left for the war. That was the last time I saw him. A noble and good man he was, but he suffered a bad end. Here I have something here that can tell the tale better than my own recollections. He searches through the shelves and comes up with a leather-bound book. And if you'd like to know more, you might ask Althea. She's been the one to handle the trouble with him as of late. Need help? Morgan Latimer. Never heard of... Oh, you mean Moyla Dim. I guess you haven't heard the story. Well, I'll give you the short version. A wandering undead calling itself Morla Dim has been wandering Duskwood. From what we've gathered, it appears to be the undead body of Morgan Lattimore, of whom you apparently know. He's been causing us all sorts of problems, attacking watchmen on patrol and killing people. You seem to be capable enough. Maybe you can lay him to rest. From what my scouts tell me, Morla Dim wanders throughout Duskwood, following a strange and meandering path through the cemetery. We buried him out past the house on the hill. You know where that is? There isn't anything I can do to help you, but I wish you good luck. Safe travels. Morgan Lattimore was a great and noble knight who fought in defense of the innocent, the poor, and the afflicted. For many years, he worked diligently throughout the underlying areas of Azeroth, bringing relief to the suffering and swift justice to evildoers. He was married to a young girl named Lys in the summer of the 18th year. They were much in love with each other and would eventually produce three children, a son and two daughters. Morgan was 32 when war broke out in Lordaeron. Morgan was called to the side of the legendary paladin Uther the Lightbringer to fight against the orcs and the undead. Leaving his wife and children in the safety of his home, Morgan left for war. The years passed and the war dragged on, and Morgan would witness many horrific events, including the disbanding of the paladins of the Silver Hand, the death of Uther, and the spread of the plague. The only thing that kept him from the brink of madness was the knowledge that he would someday be reunited with his wife and children. Morgan would eventually return to his homeland, but find it nothing like how he remembered. The once verdant forest was corrupted and teeming with the undead and other dark forces. Destroyed houses and farms could be found everywhere, and a cemetery near Raven Hill now dominated much of the area. A shocked and bewildered Morgan eventually made his way to his home, only to find it in ruins. Not knowing what had befallen his homeland, he headed towards the village to find answers, and he hoped his wife and children. Morgan inquired about his family, but could not find any answers. A priest in Darkshire, as it was now called, said that he might search the cemetery at Raven Hill for a gravestone. Morgan refused to believe that his family was dead, and continued to search every farm and house in Duskwood, but to no avail. Morgan rode from Darkshire to nearby Lakeshire, thinking that perhaps his family had fled. On his way there, he decided against his better judgment to stop by the Raven Hill Cemetery. Morgan spent hours walking amongst the gravestones. He recognized many names of people that he knew and became more and more distraught. Then he saw them, a small untended plot amongst the many with three small gravestones. A feeling of dread washed over him as he approached. Morgan brushed off the dust 
of the most prominent gravestone to reveal the name on it. Simply carved upon the grave, letters spelled out his worst fears. Lice Lattimore, beloved wife and mother. Morgan's apprehension turned to dismay and then to grief, and he fell to his knees weeping. For hours he stared at that one grave, begging the cold stone for forgiveness and sobbing apologies. Then, hours later, something in him snapped, and he began to lash out. He brought his sword out of its scabbard and began to rain blows on the gravestone, screaming in rage, blind in fury. He lashed out and swung wildly, catching the notice of a trio of cemetery attendants. As they tried to restrain him, he turned his focus to them, hurling accusations of guilt upon the innocent attendants, then killed them all. Later, when the rage had passed, realization crept into Morgan's mind, and he saw his bloody sword driven into the chest of one of the attendants. Driven to the brink by his emotions, he removed his belt knife and plunged it deep into his heart. Morgan Lattimore's body and the three bodies of the victims were found the next day. He was quickly buried without ceremony in a hastily dug grave on the outskirts of the cemetery. Because Morgan committed murder against innocence, something that went completely against his beliefs and nature, and because of the grief that he held in being unable to save his family, Morgan could not die a peaceful death and lived on as one of the restless dead. Only days later, his grave was disturbed and his body could not be found. The being that was Morgan now wanders Duskwood, consumed by his grief over the loss of his wife and children and his own self-hatred. Moyla Dim, as he now calls himself, roams Duskwood with mindless vengeance and hatred and has been known to commit murder indiscriminately. do for you. And don't blame you if you're having trouble with him, Gidwin. Some of our strongest watchers have been lost to Morla Dim. <clears throat> you killed them? That's no small accomplishment, Gidwin. On behalf of the people of Darkshire and the Night Watch, I thank you. Uh, there is one small matter, however. I should have told you this earlier. How do I put it? Morgan may have believed that his family was all dead, but in fact, his daughter, Sarah Lattimore, is now a watcher. She's always been troubled by the circumstances surrounding her father's death. Perhaps you should go to bring the news to her. Farewell. King's honor, friend. Yes, my, my father. I wish there was something I could have done for him. If only I had talked to him before he... Here, take this and lay it on his grave. Maybe somehow he'll know I'm okay, and that none of us holds him responsible for what happened. There are tears in her eyes now, as she slides a ring from her right hand and presses it into your hand. And, and thank you, Gidwin. Light bless you. Leave me be. A ghostly voice sounds on the wind. This is... Sarah? Could it be she's still alive? The weight is removed from my shoulders. Gidwin, take my sword. Arceus, as my soul is put to rest, I have no more need for it. It was forged to do good, and though I have proved myself unworthy to hold it, perhaps you will carry on the light through it. Lease, my love. My sword Arceus served me well in life, but at last my spirit may pass from this unhappy existence and I need it no longer. 
I shall cling to the love of my daughter and hope that I will find forgiveness under the light for my sins. Honestly, really just a sad story, really well told, and almost all of it takes place within that book. If you literally don't read that book, you have no idea about what's even going on with this character. It's actually kind of funny because I don't think there's anything like that in Live Wow where you have a, a book that actually gets given to you or even gets found somewhere that explains like a vast majority of the storyline you're doing. Maybe that's not a good thing. I don't know exactly how people feel about it, but I love it because it allows you to keep that book too. Like that book is still mine. I can put it in my inventory. I can put it in my bank and read it again down the road. So it feels like I have a real connection to this character and the storyline. It's really just four or five quests and kind of travel back and forth twice and that's it. And this quest line does still exist in Live Wow. So it's still a really good insight into what happened in the human lands. And, and I think really if any of the storylines we've taken a look at so far in Classic, this one might actually be one of the best examples because the human story in, in Wow in general is so rich. It starts in Warcraft 3 with one of the most interesting character dynamics that has ever existed in any media I have ever experienced. And and they bring that back up again with Uther and the disbanding of the knights there. And it's just so good, man. Seeing that and just reliving that. Yeah, maybe it's a little nostalgic, but it is also very well written. So the final storyline, speaking of well written, is probably the most compelling thing that is written in this video game of World of Warcraft Classic. I think anybody who has done this storyline or has come through Duskwood knows about the legend of Stalvin, and it's almost still shocking to me. Even though I've done this quest multiple times, I've read these stories multiple times, every time I read it, I still can't help but feel emotional, almost a little scared. Let's get right to it. You need something? Last night, a horrible disturbance ripped through my veins. I sensed that my granddaughter, Alyssa, was in great danger. I consulted the cards, and death stared up at me from the table. After taking a long journey through the dark trance, I was able to uncover a clue to this terrifying mystery. A name came to me. The name of Stalvin. Seek out the clerk in the town hall and see if you can find out more about this character. I fear for us all. Good day to you. Uh, so, Madam Eva sent you? Stalvin, eh? Uh, let me check the town registry. Stalvin. Stalvin. Oh, uh, let's see. Ah, here we go. I have a record of Mr. Stalvin Mismantle. The last recorded address is the Moonbrook Schoolhouse. <laughs> My. Talk about outdated. Do me a favor, will you, friend? If you happen to go to Moonbrook, let me know if you get any update on this fellow. I like to keep the record clean. The old footlocker creaks open. Find a dusty, unsent letter in the old footlocker. Let the legend of Stalvin rest. To the Honorable Headmaster Cerulean, my former master, I write to you so that you might know what your apprentice has been doing of late. Paying heed to your advice, I sought to build my knowledge and wisdom through travel outside the gates of our beloved Stormwind. My journey took me to many places, but I have decided to take up residence here in the lovely town of Moonbrook. The surrounding fields of Westfall are the most beautiful as the harvest approaches. Within just a few days of my visit, I found myself tutoring my local children from the nearby farmlands. The lessons went so well that the town mayor commissioned me to run a school, and construction has begun on a brand new schoolhouse. From Silver Pine to Stormwind, and now Moonbrook, who would have guessed I would see so much of Azeroth? Warm regards, Stalvin Mistmantle. Hey there. Oh, I remember you. You're the one who was asking about that Stalvin fellow. Did you ever find what you were looking for? So the chap did spend some time in Moonbrook after all. And it's rather odd the letter never got delivered. Nonetheless, I shall update the registry. Oh my, I must have missed this the first time. In the registry, right beneath the first address for Stalvin, there's another one listed, only partially scratched out. 
Looks like he was headed to the Lion's Pride Inn over in Goldshire. Might want to check there, Gidwin. Hello. Stalvin. Uh, sure sounds familiar. <laughs> the name Stalvin rings a bell. I remember now. Many years back on a stormy night, a messenger came in, seeking refuge for the night. Near the stroke of midnight, the man ran down the stairs screaming, his face pale with fear. Still wearing his bedclothes, he disappeared into the downpour. In his haste, he forgot his letters in the chest upstairs. He never returned for them. One remains from the Stalvin fellow, intended for the canal district in Stormwind. Help yourself to it. See you around. Dear noble sir, word of your need for a tutor for your children has traveled to me here in Goldshire, where I take up temporary residence in the Lion Pride Inn. Due to the unfortunate state of events in the region, I was forced to abandon my post as headmaster of the Moonbrook School. Please accept my application to serve as tutor for your offspring. Headmaster Cerulean of the Academy can speak to you of my abilities if necessary. I shall travel to meet you in person when the winter rains subside and the roads are suitable for travel once again. Until then, Stalvin Mismantle of Silverpine. Hey there. What have you got here? Let me take a look at that. Uh, you've got some nerve bringing this here. My father was the caretaker of the estate long before I was. He had to mop the blood up after the massacre, but that's neither here nor there. The last funds of the Flint Ridge Trust have dried up. Now the last of the family possessions are headed for auction. Blame the tax vultures. I guess if you're really itching to learn more, you're free to look through this junk. Who knows what you might find. For the Alliance. You slowly slide the lid off the crate. Inside the crate you find various objects. Musty heirlooms, a family portrait, a few hunting trophies, some old books. Near the bottom, underneath the ceramic vase, you uncover a torn journal page. Kyle's the boy, seems a bit rambunctious and will be a challenge to educate. However, the elder daughter, Taloa, Seems exceptionally smart. I couldn't help but to notice her captivating beauty as well. She's on the cusp of womanhood now. Supposedly the Lord has arranged her marriage for next year. But I digress. This week I will accompany the family to their summer cottage near the Eastvale logging camp in Elwyn, close to the Red Ridge Mountains. I hope to write more while there. Well met. What have you got there? I cannot see. My eyesight is very bad. P put it in my hands. I can barely make out those letters. But that writing style reminds me of something I once saw before my vision became so poor. There was a bundle of parchments in the chest upstairs when I moved into this place. I looked at them once when I first arrived, but I gave up once the fog hazed over my peepers. Do an old nearly blind man a favor and check the chest upstairs for anything that might help you in your quest to discover more about this Stalvin character. I'm pretty sure there's a faded journal page that might be of interest to you. Bring it to me and I'll help in any way I can. Go with honor, friend. Well, not in the matters of past, Gidwin. More strange and uncontrollable feeling. Never have I felt this way. Never have I felt the way I did today. While assisting Giles with his history lesson, Taloa was outside tending to the flower garden. 
After a few minutes, she came inside and placed a scarlet begonia in my open palm and smiled at me in such a way that my heart felt as though it was trembling within my chest. What can I do for you? Did you find that page I mentioned, Gidwin? Oh, you, you found it. I know of someone who might be able to assist you. Back when I was leading the Stormwind Guard, we used to get drinks at the Scarlet Raven Tavern in Darkshire. The innkeeper there, Smiths, was quite an expert on the local lore. Show him this page and see what he has to say about it. What can I do for you? Marshal Haggard sent you? Why didn't you say so? Ah, good old Haggard. Poor chap is going to be completely blind before long. Anyway, let me see what you've got here. <laughs> By the light, you bet I recognize that handwriting. I followed the legend of that Stalvin character for years. When those visiting nobles were slaughtered a few years back, I went with Haggard to investigate. I found these muddy pages, but we were never able to link the handwriting to that crazy man in the woods. Your trail of evidence proves his guilt. Take this to Commander Ebonlock immediately and fill her in on what you've discovered. Most certain that she shares the same feelings for me now. She even placed her hand on mine this morning. When she smiles, her eyes light up like glittering diamonds. Unspoken words pass between us. I can feel her in my pounding heart and heated veins. Anger and the fury the likes of which I never knew existed. How dare she? I was instructing Giles in the meaning of numbers. Taloa appears before me with a suitor. Holding hands in public, nonetheless. What an uncouth young man. Rather than introduce me properly, Taloa said simply, Oh, that's just my tutor, Uncle Stalvin. He's a nice old man. Old? At that word, my cheeks flush with heat. I am but a few years older, and yet she betrays me. This better be good, Paladin. Let me see what you have, and tell me your tale. But by the light, be quick about it. Darkshire's defense is number one priority. I have not the time to squander on dead-end leads. My, you have proved yourself to be quite a detective, Paladin. I've had my eyes on that creep Stalvin for quite some time, but... If this page was written by the same hand, it proves his guilt beyond a shadow of doubt. In all his days keeping the town registry, Clerk Daltrey has become an expert at identifying handwriting. Show him this page and see if the writing matches that of the registry's signature. Farewell. Downward spiral of despair. First she mocks me, now she is engaged. The ungracious charlatan was pretending to love, when truly she desired to hurt me all along. A black void lurks with me now and grows with each waking moment. The blood I shall spill pales in comparison to the tears I have shed. Let Commander Ebonlock know immediately that the handwriting matched Gidwin. Her suspicions were correct. Have a good one. Can I help you? I knew it. Fine work, Gidwin. Stalvin Mismanel led a life of depravity. Innocent victims died by his hands. Undoubtedly, he is guilty of countless crimes. Now the lunatic threatens Darkshire. The light only knows what sordid acts he is plotting. Travel to his cottage just north of town, Paladin, and execute Stalvin once and for all. When the deed is done, travel to Madame Eva's and show her his family ring. After all, it was her premonition that led to this gruesome discovery. But Darkshire is safer because of her. See you around. Taloa, is that you? Why oh, no, it's just some dirty dwarf. Well met. Yes, Gidwin? Uh, I know, Gidwin. Stalvin is dead. I sense a wave of hope ripple through the tainted forest. Once and for all, Duskwood is free from his bloodthirst. 
My joy is hampered by thoughts of those who fell prey to the horrible beast. Nonetheless, you are a brave and cunning paladin. Go with honor, friend. Tears unshed, dry and die. It is a sad story, but it's also a scary story. Not only is there murder, but he becomes an undead. So the story might end there for classic, but it's actually continued very well in Cataclysm. So you might consider that us in classic are investigating the murder and then taking action against Stalvin Mismanel, but he's an undead. It's not really explained why or how that occurs, but obviously he's not going to die for good in that state. So in the Cataclysm version, you retrace the steps of what the original classic character might have discovered. Looks like all the pages of the documents are scattered around the zone this time, so instead of having to go back through the original areas, you just find them throughout Duskwood. And you're doing this at the behest of his brother. It's a very interesting storyline, and honestly, a really good part two to one of my favorite chapters in any WoW history. Truly, Duskwood, both in Classic WoW and Live WoW, is an exceptional experience. Perhaps one of the best zones start to finish in terms of density of good story. So I hope that you enjoy this today. The human storylines really are something special, in classic especially, but all throughout history of WoW. I hope to be able to continue to bring those stories to good video and share them with you guys. Thank you for watching. We'll see you in the next one.